All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Invasive Crayfish Collaborative webinar. My name is Natalia. I'm with Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, and I'm the main facilitator of the Invasive Crayfish Collaborative. And for those of you who don't know what the ICC is, it's a program that brings together a variety of experts and stakeholders to address the threat of invasive crayfish in the Great Lakes region. We create monthly newsletters highlighting recent crayfish literature and news, host webinars like this one about new crayfish research and programs. We also work and collaborate with other organizations on various research projects, and in general, just help promote responsible crayfish practices. So before we begin, I, as usual, will quickly share a list of different links that you can follow if you're interested in learning more about the ICC. You can check, our, check out our website, invasivecrayfish.org, which acts as a one-stop shop for invasive crayfish information and is always being updated with new information. Um, if you want to join the ICC membership, you can follow the join link to find our subscription form, and you'll be subscribing to our monthly newsletters and will periodically receive notifications about upcoming webinars, meetings, and other events. And finally, if you're interested in registering for future webinars or viewing past recorded webinars, you can follow the, the last two links. Um, and you can also email me uh, at schwaruk at illinois.edu if you have any questions or comments. Um, and I believe that we are adding these links to the chat so you can easily access them. So one of the goals of the ICC is to make new information or any information regarding invasive crayfish more accessible, which in turn will make people more informed, enabling them to make better decisions about invasive crayfish management. So in today's webinar, we have Annie Allert from the U.S. Geological Survey here to discuss the permitting process um, that managers must undergo when interested in using chemical treatments to control invasive crayfish populations in ponds. Um, and for those who don't know Annie, she is a research fish biologist at the U.S. Geological Survey Columbia Environmental Research Center, who conducts on-site assessments investigating the effects of contaminants on aquatic ecosystems and new methods for the control of invasive crayfish. Her work has recently focused on the effects of lead mining on native crayfish populations in Missouri and the use of chemical chemical control for invasive red swamp crayfish in Southeast Michigan. She obtained a bachelor's and master's degrees in fisheries and wildlife from Michigan State University. Thank you so much, Annie, for being here. Uh, so to everyone joining us today, uh, we encourage you to type in any questions that you may have in the Q&A box or in the chat at any point during the presentation, and then we'll go through them together afterwards. Also, as a quick reminder, this webinar is being recorded and it may be posted on the ICC website as well as on YouTube with captions. Um, all right, so with that, Annie, you can go ahead and begin sharing your screen. Thanks, Natalia. Um, uh, I do wanna make one clarification. It's been so long since I was in school. Um, I got my undergraduate from Michigan State University, but I got my master's degree from the University of Missouri. So I forgot oh, to I put that in. That <laughs> no, I think I probably forgot that was, you know, distant past. So, uh, okay. And um, thank you too for um, this opportunity to um, discuss our research today. Okay, so I'm gonna try to... Um, yeah, I, we really appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, share our experiences um, of our chemical treatments of ponds for invasive red swamp crayfish in Michigan. I'd like to acknowledge my uh, collaborative and competent team of co-authors that are from several universities and federal and state resource and regulatory agencies. Um, the diverse nature of our roles and responsibilities have been a key asset during this project. I'd also like to acknowledge our funding source, sources and staff who help design equipment and conduct treatments in Southeast Michigan. Our permits were obtained and the treatments conducted under the guidance of the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy or EGLE and the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development or MDARD. So why would we consider pesticide treatments to control invasive crayfish? Well, North America has more native and highly endemic crayfish species of any continent, and crayfish are key components of ecosystems. 
Invasive crayfish displace endemic species and alter communities and ecosystems, introduce pathogens, and they can cause significant economic damage. Control methods can focus on a variety of approaches such as prevention, eradication, and containment or management based on where infestations are on the invasion curve. However, resource managers lack tools and expertise to address invasive crayfish. We believe that pesticide treatments can be used individually or in tandem with other control methods to meet management goals with a relatively low risk to environmental and human health and may be appropriate for recent or established populations of invasive crayfish. The objective of our presentation are to review the types of permits that were required to treat ponds in Michigan with a commercial pesticide containing pyrethrin and to identify the documents that we can share. We also will present information about how we work through the permitting process and other equipment and staffing needs uh, for conducting the treatments. The Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, or FRIFRA, gives the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency the regulatory authority for the registration of chemicals in the United States, which includes registration, distribution, sale, and use. Think where, how, how much, and how often the chemical or pesticide may be used. FRIFRA speci specifies that using a chemical or pesticide will not cause unreasonable adverse effects to the environment, meaning it sets out to balance ecological risk and the benefits of using a chemical or pesticide. Pesticide labels provide instructions for the use, storage, disposal, and record keeping required for pesticide use. It is a violation of federal law to use products in a manner inconsistent with product labeling. Pesticide registration and labeling require extensive data on potential health and environmental effects and guide the condition, direction, and precautions that define the use of a chemical or pesticide. Because this of, of this authority and the fact that no pesticide is registered for the control of invasive crayfish in aquatic ecosystems, a new pesticide label and special use permit were required for the invasive crayfish treatments in Michigan. Although the US EPA is the regulatory authority for chemical use, state agencies also have a role in the enforcement of pesticide labels. The US EPA also has the authority to permit emergency exemptions or section 18s for the unregistered use of pesticides to address emergency conditions or which are issued for a finite period of time. There are different types of Section 18s or emergency exemptions depending on the type of emergency that exists. We worked under a quarantine exemption permit, which allows for the off-label use of a pesticide based on a geographic area and a time period because of an urgent need. This type of per permit also requires monitoring for the potential risk to human and environmental health. In addition to FRIFRA, the Clean Water Act prohibits the discharge of pollutants via a point source into the waters of the United States without a permit. The Clean Water Act regulates what and how much can be discharged and what monitoring and reporting requirements are needed for that point discharge source. National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permits or NPDES permits are issued by the state with US EPA approval. The permit translates the requirements of the Clean Water Act into the specific provisions of the operation of the discharging pollutants to ensure that the discharges do not affect human or environmental health. And although our ponds were stormwater retention ponds, the state of Michigan determined that they did qualify as waters of the state, so we were required to get an NPDES permit. U.S. EPA authorizations are based on a variety of things, but include public review, comment periods, and public hearings. States may receive authorization for one or more NPDES program components. Program components include authorizations for NPDES permits and general permits, authorization for pretreatment and biosolid pro programs, 
and authorizations to regulate federal facilities. US EPA will remain the permitting authority in states without authorizations. For example, if states don't have authorizations for federal facilities, US EPA would continue to issue permit to federal facilities such as military bases, national parks, or federal lands. One other note, even after states receive NPDES authorizations, authorization, US EPA continues to issue UP NPDES permits on tribal land if the tribe is not administering its own NPDES author uh, program. In Michigan, MDARD is the lead agency for Section 18 permits, and EGLE is the um, agency oversight, overseeing NPDES permits. Considerations for granting Section 18 permits include the validity of the emergency claim, the risk to human health, and the risk of occupational and environmental exposure. It requires that a product is identified and the product registrant is supportive of its use. Resource managers must provide regulatory agencies with a nominal or target concentration and a plan for how, how often, and where the chemical will be applied. Approval of the permit will greatly depend on whether there will be discharge off the treatment site, the potential effects to non-target species and habitats, including those of the endangered species and threatened species, and the mitigation and monitoring plans for the treatments. One aspect of monitoring um, is the need for analytical capabilities to measure concentrations of all active ingredients in pesticides that are collected in environmental samples. So section 18 permit applications are very prescriptive. The components of the permit applications are list, listed here and include the type of permit being requested, contact persons, the pesticide to be used, the site where the pesticide will be used, application methods, and an explanation of why the use of pesticide is required. It also, again, requires the confirmation that the registrant is aware of the permit request. In addition, quarantine exemption permits also in, must include the pest name, the origin of the pest, and real and potential impacts of the pest. Chemical or pesticide labels can provide needed information for helping identify pest, a pesticide to be used in chemical treatments. They will list the active ingredients, the registrant or manufacturer, and the regulatory registration number for the pesticide. With this information in the Googles, you can typically search for the manufacturer's website to obtain contact information to begin communicating to the registrant. In our case, we worked with the Director of State Regulatory Affairs. So upon um, the review and approval of the permit, authorization notification for Section 18s come in the form of an authorization le letter and a special use label. They contain many of the same elements of the application, which include the effective dates for the permit, dates for interim and final reports, the product and product manufacturer, active ingredients, exemptions from the newly labeled use, responsible parties, regulations for the permitted activity, and the area where the treatments are allowed. So with interim and final reports, um, again, they will um, be addressing the same list of components in the permit application and authorization. Reports and components include the project title, the project, the permit type, time period of the permit, contact information. In addition, a summary of the total acreage and the amount of pesticide used, the effectiveness of the treatments, a description of unexpected adverse effects, any enforcement, actions and all results of all monitoring activities. Reports are sent to, 
in, in our case, reports were sent to the state agency, which then tra uh, transferred um, the submissions to US EPA. And in our case, effectiveness was um, determined by catch per unit effort in our cage pre and post treatments. And monitoring data included pesticide concentrations in water. So when we first started to consider chemical treatments, we contacted Heidi Bunk at the Wisconsin DNR, who was a tremendous help to us. She warned us that it would probably take up to two years to complete this process, and it did. However, since then, the resource agency and the regulatory side of this process has learned a lot, and the process has gotten to be much more efficient. It took less than six months to renew our Section 18 permit last year, and we believe that others will continue to benefit from our experience. Key takeaways for Section 18s include that they're good for three years, yay, it's important to think big um, when you're um, about the area to include in the permit because future infestations may occur and treatments may be needed in those new habitats. Messaging on warning signs uh, can be simple and straightforward but need to be consistent with language in the section 18 permit, the special use label and NPDES permits. And finally, although there are annual reports due for the uh, Section 18 permits information in the application and annual reports are really uh, helpful and, and fairly redundant. It took us um, about, again, two years to get this process going, uh, fit, completed, but then six months upon renewal, and it takes about one or two months to prepare reports. So these are the um, some documents that we'll be happy to share with anybody that would be interested in in them. If there's time after the talk, we might be able to walk through uh, one or two of these documents as well. Okay, so now let's talk NPDES permits. NPDES permits uh, work concurrently with Section 18 permits and contain, again, many of the same components and information of Section 18 permits. Differences include that NPDES permits focus on the waters of the state, point sources and discharges off the treatment site. Key points include it's incredibly important to engage the regulatory agencies early to work collaboratively during this process. Understanding where each side is coming from is, important, um, is an important step in, in understanding what steps need to be taken prior to the permits being issued. Um, our team decided that it was important to work to develop work plans, which allowed for each treatment site, which allowed flexibility um, for meeting the requirements of the NPDES permits, but keeping the actual permits streamlined to the necessary components required um, in a regulatory framework. In addition, outreach and stakeholder buy-in is in, an important component of the process. Public comment periods or notices are also required. Our permits required monitoring for pesticide concentrations in the treated ponds and downstream of the treatment sites since we had discharges off of our treatment sites. Finally, mitigation strategies used in our treatments included weather forecasting and the use of biofilters to limit the risk of pesticide exposure downstream of treatment sites. The work plans we developed with EGLE, again, focused on individual treatment sites. So every treatment site has or had a work plan. Treatment sites all had multiple ponds. Work plan plans are framed around the same information in the NPDES permit, but contain more details about those components. The background and goals and objectives for treating ponds, site descriptions, and descriptions of how treatments will be conducted were included in the work plans. Work plans also include the number and size of ponds, the target concentration, the amount of pesticide to be used, and monitoring mitigation plans for the site. In our case, the weather forecasting was intended to make sure that the treatments were conducted only in clear weather to reduce the chance of high discharges off the sites around the time of the treatments. 
and PDS permits are issued for five years with annual reports due. Again, there's a lot of overlap in the information from the permit application and what's required in the reports. The timeline for putting uh, the reports uh, together are again about a month or two. And in our case, we, we submitted our reports to um, a Michigan website um, serviced by Eagle um, to transmit our report to the US EPA. And again, we, we can share our NPDES permit application, permit and work plans if anyone is interested. Um, they can also be found at that portal. You can download them from the portal or, or view them. Um, a final note about our NPDES permit, we needed an amendment to our NPDES permit because we placed biofilters uh, in drains, um, outflow and inflow drains, which restricted flow. And so these permits are pretty straightforward to obtain, at least in our case, but it was a good lesson uh, to make sure you work across all agencies that are charged with regulating waters of the state within your state. So another thing to think about in terms of chemical treatments, uh, you can't just have someone show up and dump a bunch of chemical into the pond. You need to have a commercial pesticide applicator license to apply the chemical. And in our case, um, we were required to take two courses, the core applicator certification course and the aquatic pest management course. The course material is online. It can be downloaded like for Luddites like me who need hard copies. Um, there's a small fee or nominal fee associated with certification. Certifications are good for three years. They need to be renewed, but, um, and so you might need to take the uh, retake tests. Um, states have re reciprocity, um, but even in states that don't, um, like Missouri and Michigan, I was able to take my test in Missouri um, to obtain a license to treat in Michigan. But reciprocity also is helpful if you um, think you're going to need to treat ponds across state lines. And for Michigan, they have reciprocity with Indiana, uh, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. So that's the information we, we have for permits. So I'm going to shift now and discuss uh, a little bit about our bioassays, the type of biofilters that we use, um, and several methods that we use to treat um, or apply chemicals into ponds. And with that, I'll talk about some of the equipment and some of the staffing needs uh, required around those um, chemical treatments. For our bioassays, um, we used ghee minnow traps modified to prevent crayfish from either leaving or entering uh, cages, meaning we zip, zip tied the holes closed. Um, cages were placed in the water column and at the pond surface so we could monitor uh, the distribution and effectiveness of the pesticide throughout the pond. We obtained crayfish from ponds off site, um, certainly not ones that we were going to treat. And in the first two years, we cultured crayfish in a mobile lab prior to putting them in the bioassay or using them in the bioassay. However, last year we trapped and pretty much immediately then put them into our bioassay cage without culture. It's somewhat helpful to use culturing facilities on site so you can stockpile crayfish, but you can get away with um, just immediately moving them. But the number of cages you can deploy are based on the number of crayfish that you trap. So think about that. We replaced uh, crayfish daily into, into cages until survival in the treatment ponds uh, were 100%. Uh, other data that we collected were the carapace length and sex of crayfish used in the cages. In addition to sampling for pesticide concentrations in water, which is required, you may want to um, collect additional water quality data or solar radiation readings, especially if treatments are going to be conducted in more than one season, because things like organic carbon, temperature, pH, alkalinity, and solar radiation can all impact the degradation rate of the pesticide. So that would affect when the bioassays end or when you get to you know, a nominal pesticide concentration of zero, so you can end your monitoring or sampling for pesticide concentrations. And it also, that data may also be helpful moving forward in trying to get um, 
a more formal registration for the chemical. So in terms of mitigation, uh, we used a variety of biofilter bags, which were placed on top of or in front of outflow and inflows of ponds. Um, you know, the outflow from one pond and the inflow of the downstream pond within each treatment site to provide multiple layers of um, filtration at our treatment site before we had discharge off the site. The biofilters, were, we were trying to um, balance the keeping water level stable, stable and but also provide sufficient resident time in our biofilter bags. And we first used biochar and activated carbon um, placed into pillow sacks and gunny sacks, but um, we had water levels rise by about a foot and that might be a concern in urban situations because of flooding of roads. We then moved to a product that we thought would work. Uh, it's a commercial product used in, in storm drain um, management. However, the permit, permeability of the Enviro sock was really low and it really kind of confused and surprised us. So again, we were having water flow around the sock rather than through it. So last year we ended up using lump charcoal and wood chips, um, and this allowed good flow through the bags, but also provided a good amount of bi organic binding site to grab onto pesticide. We haven't seen pyrethrin off our treatment sites using any of these methods. However, we have had um, a measurable concentration of the synergist in our um, pesticide, piperinol butoxide, off the treatment site. So when we're applying chemical, our goal is to limit airborne dispersal of the active ingredients to lower risk to human and non-target organisms and habitats. So we're applying the chemical under the water surface. So in the first couple of years, we used a variety of booms, um, either a bucket boom, or a platform boom that was used in much more shallow water or a remote com control boat that had a, a PVC boom attached to it. So we were trying to actively distribute the chemical around the ponds with these, with these methods. Um, you know, we had hoped to use a small John boat with a trolling motor, but our ponds were really shallow and had a lot of macrophytes, so we weren't able to do that. So instead of a bigger boat, we made a boom. And despite the, I'm sorry, the success of those chemical treatments, um, we ended up last year designing an irrigation hose system. So maybe we could treat more ponds with the same number of people um, on treatment days. And with irrigation hose, we were targeting the ring where our trapping was conducted. And it was, it's also the area that Red Swamp crayfish use most as um, defined by a, an acoustic telemetry study that we're about to publish. But in both cases, we did observe chemical being dispersed throughout the pond and we, it would appear that we had good mixing in the ponds. So for any of these methods where you're diluting the chemical in water, you need certain equipment, and that would include the chemical delivery uh, system. So you need a source of water. We use municipal water. We need a, a pressurized tank with a hose, a battery to operate the motor on the tank, and then a, a means to get it to the ponds. We use garden carts, gators, and I think maybe a truck. Safety equipment is critical, personal protective equipment or PPE emergency um, equipment, including eyewash stations, portable showers and spill kits, and then um, equipment to clean up soap and water for hands um, and trash containers so no, uh, nothing is left on site after the treatments are completed. For the irrigation hose, we ended up um, using a portable or cordless air compressor to evacuate the line, similar to what you would do uh, in your uh, home ir irrigation system for grass or at golf course. We just wanted to make sure that we can remove the liquid and, and keep our emitters from clogging. 
So because irrigation hose treatment treatments include a bit more thought than using or designing booms for chemical treatment, we thought we'd talk a little bit about how we designed our system and the staff needed for deploying and maintaining the system. For the irrigation hose system, you have to try to figure out what rate that you want the chemical delivered based on the size of your tank and the size of your pond. So you need to make sure, and in our case, we were putting a ring uh, just about five meters or a meter inside from the, the pond bank, that when the system was pressurized and you start having flow into your hose run, the emitters closest to the tanks will start peeing immediately. And then the next set, and then the next set until you get to the end of your hose run. And so if the hose is running too fast, you may not get, or peeing too fast, you may not get to the end of your hose run. So you just kind of have to figure out, you know, how fast your emitters are gonna deliver it, the run that you're going over. And it's a fairly simple straight ahead math problem at that point. To help deal with the issue of long runs, we decided that we would put two mirror images in our pond. So we would have a tank centrally located in a hose run. So we would end up having four lengths of hose and that we could make sure that we didn't have a hose run longer than say 300 feet. And we ended up using six gallon an hour emitters and we, we could empty a 25 gallon tank in less than an hour but we had pesticide reaching the end of all of our runs in, within a pond. We ordered our equipment from dripworks.com and we opted to use the half inch fittings and hose because it matched up closely with our um, pressurized tank hose. Um, we were um, dealing with uh, ponds that we might need a thousand, no more than a thousand foot of hose, but we decided that 500 foot rolls of hose were much easier to work with because the, the hose is thin walled and tends to uh, kink. Emitters like the woodpeckers um, were pretty true to their ratings, uh, maybe slightly delivering pesticide quicker than the rating, but they were really pretty accurate. Fittings are really easy to use. You just slide the hose over the fitting and then tighten down. You need to be careful because I believe it's not righty tighty, light lefty loosey. It's the opposite of that. And the best part name ever, goof plugs, allow you to make mistakes without starting all over again. It's just great. <laughs> Um, also, Dripworks has the tools needed to uh, install all your emitters. Um, and fittings. So what did it cost to treat ponds uh, using irrigation holes last year? We treated two sites uh, with, um, with eight or nine um, ponds, depending on when we treated, did, conducted our treatment. The ponds ranged in size from a tenth to a, an acre. Um, pond depths were less than three feet, probably considerably less than that. Um, the cost for the hose, which was about 16 rolls, about 300 emitters, uh, of, you know, about 120 fittings and connectors, and a bag of goof plugs was about $1,600. We required um, nine cases of eight pints each or 72 pints of chemical to treat that amount of acreage or volume of ponds, and um, it cost about $4,200 per treatment. So the total cost for two treatments last year was about $10,000. Okay, in terms of, we know the term cost of, uh, of equipment and pesticide, what about staffing needs? A crew of four to five people can deploy equipment pretty efficiently. We deployed equipment in nine ponds in about a week. Uh, we went out and did our pre-treatment checks um, and we did need to repair some hose uh, because of muskrat damage and emitters clogging um, from being in ponds. But again, about five people could get that work done in about a week. The number of staff needed tr on treatment days is significant, but goes down post-treatment uh, during the monitoring period. There are a lot of activities uh, to be conducted on site uh, besides applying chemical into ponds. 
and that would include uh, deploying biofilters, signage, water sampling, clearing lines after the chemical application, removing dead fish, and then monitoring the bioassay. So given the cost and staffing needs, um, you know, are chemical treatments cost-effective compared to intensive trapping? Well, the staff requirements are different. Um, in, in the case of chemical treatments, staff, need, staff needs are generally for short periods of time, usually a week or two, while intensive trapping efforts um, pretty much eat up the time for eight to 12 people during the field season, meaning um, with the use of chemical treatments, it would allow staff to work on other uh, activities related to invasive crayfish while trapping is a full-time job. Uh, and we were able to treat more ponds using irrigation hose than booms. Um, so, you know, that, that's a, a plus for the using irrigation um, treatments. You might be able to treat more ponds if you're willing to invest in um, more tanks or have more staff on site. And of course you would need more people, possibly more commercial licenses um, associated with that, those staff. And finally, you know, we learned from a previous seminar or webinar given by Kathleen, a co-author on this presentation that chemical treatments appear to be more effective in reducing trap catches and catches remain lower for longer periods than trapping effort, if trapping efforts are reduced. Um, so, you know, it, it may be a more effective means for controlling invasive crayfish than intensive trapping. So in summary, um, you know, resource managers are, are challenged by invasive crayfish. Um, there are limited, there's, you know, invasive crayfish are impactful to native organisms and ecosystems. And there's limited expertise for funding and funding and control tools. Um, permits are required for chemical treatments. And it's really um, critical to get interagency communication and working groups uh, to, uh, together to facilitate the permitting process. It's important to start talking early to regulatory agencies and pesticide uh, manufacturers to keep the process moving. While the permitting process includes a lot of paperwork, it's a prescriptive process. Think what, why, how much, and when. And with, with a well-defined objective, good background documentation, defined treatment areas, and well-thought-out treatment plans, the process will move forward. We think that chemical control is an effective tool for integrated pest management plans. Um, there's a, there appears to be a greater reduction in invasive crayfish for longer periods than intensive trapping. And there are a variety of ways you can apply the chemical that appear to, and they appear to be equally effective. So next step for us include potent, investigating whether we can not, um, apply chemical without diluting it. And this would potentially um, eliminate a lot of the equipment needed to apply chemical using dilution and maybe reduce the number of staff needed on site during treatment days. Also, we're looking into the option of an expanded label use. What does an expanded label use mean? It means possibly registering a commercial pesticide to control invasive crayfish in aquatic habitats, but this will require an appropriate pesticide and manufacturer be identified. USGS UMESC is preparing a request for information which seeks manufacturers' interest in the expanded use for pl planning purposes. And the outcome of the request for information will focus discussions with US EPA to inform label expansion options. We're currently focused on pyrethrum products and registrants based on our Michigan response during the last three or four years but we could include other active ingredients such as cypermethrin in the future. There are many considerations for label use expansion, including who the registrant will be, who will the US EPA establishment be, who will produce the product and does the manufacturer support the label expansion. 
But what it could mean is that we would have a national registration with one registrant and allow end users to obtain access to the permit and report use through a web-based system. And I would refer uh, you to the uh, example of the carbon dioxide registration for invasive carp. And with that, um, thank you for your time and we'll be happy to answer any questions if there's time. And we'll again, also happy to share or pull up any document that you'd like to look at. Great, thank you so much, Annie. Uh, we currently do not have any questions right now. So um, if you would like to, you could walk us through some, some of the few documents that you have ready for us. I think that'd be really useful. Okay, let me, wait a second. Thank you for your patience. So hopefully you can um, see that um, this first document is um, a letter, the uh, letter to request a permit, a quarantine exemption permit. And again, the um, application would go in the form of a letter to the US EPA. And it would, for us, it went through the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development. And the permit, again, has um, the components are the type of exemption, contact persons for both the administrative and technical matters, um, you know, a description of the pesticide and the registrant, registrant number, active ingredients and in trade names, how the chemical is supposed to be used, sites to be treated, we included maps and tables. We included the method of application, the rate of application, number of applications, acreage, the total acreage, total amount of pesticide to be used, when the pesticide would be used, restrictions or things that like this would this is what we would have put on our warning sign you know why pesticides uh, are required you know justification so you know we there were there are other ways to control crayfish and so we had to list them and list their limitations and then um, you know any case studies for uh, pesticide use were included. You know, we don't have to worry about residuals for food use. We discussed risk information, how we coordinated, confirmed the, the registrant's uh, awareness of the request. And then for our quarantine exemption, we identified the pest, you know, where we thought the pest in, was introduced from, and then the impact of the, of the pest. We had a short uh, list of references. In the application, we included a letter from the pesticide registration confirming their um, support and, and awareness that we were making this request. And so upon approval, we ended up getting another letter from the US EPA via uh, MDARD with the effective dates you know, the pests, the active ingredients identified, and, you know, those same components we've been talking about, you know, who, what, where, when, how much, what if things go drastically wrong, what are you going to do, how are you going to fix it, that type of stuff. But similar to goof plugs, if you uh, make a mistake in your permit, you can always ask for an amendment, which we had to do um, because we, um, 
we're incomplete in defining our treatment area. So we just go back, to, we just went back to the EPA, uh, you know, redefining our, our treatment area and we were good to go. So a special use label, you know, if you uh, look, have ever worked with a pesticide or chemical, you kind of uh, know that there are labels associated with that pesticide that you can download from the purchasing website and you can also download a safety data information sheet. So this uh, special use permit would substitute for that label use that you would, uh, you could have um, downloaded from um, a pesticide distributor. And again, effective dates, the direction for the use, where and why it's going to be used, how it's going to be applied, you know, and, you know, the um, manufacturer's uh, support of the doc, of the procedure. And again, we can uh, share um, the final reports, but it's real prescriptive. So, so in terms of the NPDES permit, again, a lot of boxes to be filled, you know, who, who's going to be discharge, being applying the chemical, you know, who, where the, what, what are the pests? What are the action thresholds? Where are they? Why do you need to use pesticide? Um, again, really repetitive, um, but uh, necessary. So we provided a public notice, uh, I think to two newspapers, uh, each time we got the, uh, an NPS uh, permit and it went out for two weeks at a time. I don't think we got any public comments, um, but we also, you know, use this to talk to our landowners and we were required to have written permission from the landowners where the treatments were gonna be um, occurred and they would uh, be submitted with um, the permit application. And so uh, the authorization came in form of, you know, a form. And this is where we had that amendment where we were uh, restricting flows. So we identified that these filter bags would be placed over drains. And then, uh, you know, pretty standard form for the permitting. We identified what our um, filter bags would look like in the permits, you know, where they would be placed at the site, um, you know, in multiple places, it were these red orange dots, how they would be placed at, a, at several treatment sites. And then we just used a Word document uh, for our work plans. And, you know, this would be the table of contents that would be a part of those work plans. So again, a lot of the same information, but, you know, we've got this um, monitoring and mitigation work where, you know, we're identifying what weather model we're using to forecast and, um, and the, spe the specifics around how much rain was acceptable. Um, prior to and during treatments. Okay. Great. Are those documents available anywhere online? So if land so managers the, want to them, they can? So the NPDES permitting documents are, are available at that Michigan Enviro portal. Um, but the, I don't, I don't know if the section 18, I, actually the section 18 documents are also av available at that uh, website that Eagles uh, maintains. Okay, so, great. Yeah. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the comments right now. Um, is there a building plan or a diagram for the pesticide delivery uh, system? So maybe a type of manual um, to help users create their own um, booms or irrigation hoses? Um, in Michigan DNR put together a um, irrigation hose protocol so for that, we could uh, share for us, you know, I just got a guy uh, who fabricates. He's really good. I tell him what I need and he just goes home and imagines. But we can certainly provide you that with the specs for that uh, information. Yeah, it's basically we drilled hold in a bucket and then a lot of just um, PVC tubing and fittings. So 
I could uh, try and maybe collaborate with you. We can put together a document with all the resources mm -hmm. and maybe mm -hmm. we can post that on the ICC so that people can yeah. refer to that as well. Um, hopefully that could be useful. Um, yeah. And uh, Katie actually added to the chat the uh, Michigan Enviro Portal that, that you mentioned. So thank you so much, Katie, for putting that link in. Mm -hmm. um, so we have an additional question. Can you speak to the non-target effects of Excite R on other aquatic organisms and whether you observed any in your study? Could this consideration limit the scope uh, of use for chemical treatments for invasive crayfish? You know, it definitely could. You know, um, Michigan has been very conservative in where they think they want to apply uh, pesticides and we're currently only using it in stormwater retention ponds. Um, and so a lot of the non-target organisms uh, probably shouldn't be there to begin with uh, or will um, just inadvertently stocked. So um, invertebrates are more sensitive to pyreth uh, py uh, permethrin than vertebrate fish species. So there's a, a small margin of safety. Wildlife and mammals are pretty insensitive to the chemical. Um, we saw a, a significant uh, mortality rate for fathead minnows and other small centurchids um, and some catfish, I believe. Um, we captured uh, amphibians, frogs, and I think we had some mortality, but not all of the frogs that we saw were dead. Um, we didn't have any mortality downstream of our sites. So, and we had waterfowl on our ponds uh, during the monitoring period after treatments and we saw no adverse effect to waterfowl um, uh, at our ponds. And we did we had no known we had known th uh, threatened and endangered species in the geographic area but none at the, our treatment sites. So these ponds had a lot of organic material, and so the pesticide's gonna wanna go to that organic material pretty quickly. Our half-lifes were 50, about 15 hours in warm water, a little bit longer in cold water. So um, our data suggests that concentrations uh, for, for pyrethrin went to zero within se um, six or seven days to 14 days. And um, you know the synergist of piperinol butoxide has a, has um, all the organisms, invertebrates, fish, birds, and mammals are really insensitive to that in terms of toxicity. But we're also exploring a pyrethrin formulation or product that doesn't have a synergist, and that may help us um, remove that, that active ingredient and the need to monitor for that chemical. But a synergist, you know, prevents the organisms from breaking that down. So we just have to make sure that we have an eff effective concentration in our ponds for an adequate time period to do what we want to do. Great, thank you so much. Um, is there a communication plan in place to inform nearby residents or communities about the pesticide use and its potential Im impacts other than the, the warning signs that I believe you had a picture of in your presentation? No, I believe there is, you know, if Kathleen's on the on the call, she might want to speak to this um, broader, but I know there was, you know, good stakeholder and outreach um, regarding the chemical treatments to try to make people not be surprised by the treatments. And we certainly got a lot of people just randomly stopping <laughs> to talk to us about, about what was going on. So Kathleen, do you have anything else to add? Uh, hi, so the work plans that we write up are approved by Eagle and then they're posted for uh, public um, comment for I think two weeks. Um, and I think they do that through the Michigan Enviro as well, but um, I, I might be wrong, but I know it's posted for a couple of weeks for public comment um, by Eagle. So uh, that's the main way that um, people can give their feedback. And we also try to reach out to people who are in the area, make sure they are on board with us applying pesticide before we even get that far. Uh, and then there are, of course, the warning signs that we post uh, on the day. So those are kind of the main ways we reach out to people in the area. 
Yeah. You know, that, that stakeholder buy-in, all property owners have to provide written permission and awareness that, that the treatments are going to be uh, made, and those are included with the permit application. I know Michigan also works with a variety of stakeholder groups, including, I think, public uh, citizen, um, you know, volunteer groups. So I think they do a pretty good job of outreach. Uh, we also created a um, a video that I think that they're going to be using to ed to do outreach and education. Um, I don't know who does that within uh, the Michigan Department of DNR, but we're hoping that tool will also bring awareness to what we're doing. Great, thank you so much, and thank you, Kathleen, for for adding mm -hmm. your your input on that. Um, so some attendees in this call, they may be involved in managing invasive crayfish and flowing water systems like rivers and streams, um, and you discussed that managers are using Excite R, for example, um, in ponds, but are there any other pesticides currently being tested or considered by resource managers to support the removal of invasive crayfish in uh, flowing systems like streams and, and rivers? Not that I'm aware of in, in the United States, but um, in Sweden, uh, they used, I think, uh, cyfluthrin, another pyrethroid um, to treat both ponds and streams downstream of an infestation site. And they ended up metering um, chemical into streams. So we could, you know, if you want to reach out to me, I can uh, share that reference. California has used um, cypermethrin uh, to treat uh, arc sites for some, you know, rare and endangered fish, I believe. So they removed the fish and then treated ponds for upwards of a year. And then once they didn't see red swamps for any length of time, they returned the native fish to those ponds. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Um, it looks like that we, we don't have any other questions in uh, the comments or in the Q&A box. Um, so, I think we will then just wrap it up unless you have any additional um, comments or or documents that you'd like to share. Um, no, but you know, thanks so much for joining us and you know, reach out to any of the co-authors. I think there are some good links in the when the presentation is posted, it'll be a good reference for some of the links that we talked about today. And you know, this the team I'm on is just top notch and they just really want to help. So reach out. Thank you so much. And it looks like we have a lot of great resource resources in the chat too. Um, we have a couple of people adding adding links and resources for um, for others. So thank you so much for adding that into the chat. Um, and if anyone has any other questions, you can email me and I'll send them and forward them to Annie um, and connect you guys that way. Um, but thank you again, Annie, so much for, for giving us your time and presenting the very important work. Um, and thank you to everyone that joined us today. Yeah. I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Take care.